got to visiting and got a little left. Good to have everyone here with us, and we are ready for Bible study tonight. We are going to be doing somewhat of a, a new twist, but it's still carrying on that idea of the, uh, the uh, harvest. And if you, have a, if you have a testimony or if there's something that's, that you've heard that's going on, uh, I'd like you to be ready to share that tonight if you'd like. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to some of that. Let's open with prayer, though. Our gracious God, thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for the opportunity and privilege to be able to get together tonight as we gather together to open your word. I pray you'd open our eyes once again to see wonderful things from your word that will cause us to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are. We thank you for what was able to be accomplished here in Idaho Falls uh, last week and all of the different dynamics. Now, Lord, we just pray that the Lord of the harvest would be the Lord of of uh, the process that allows us to go from glory to glory and let your name be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 All right. Is there any good reports? Okay, I'll start. So <laughs> the, the ripple effect of, of this uh, event is going to last more than just that weekend. Um, there has been reports of individuals who have uh, made decisions for Christ, they, not necessarily at the event, but afterwards, uh, after being exposed to it, after having a chance to let it settle, process, and so we're, we're excited to continue to hear some of that, and uh, that's part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing here in this study is because it's not meant to just be a one-night event one time one hour one day but it's meant to be something that's planted and like a seed when you plant it if it gets watered if it gets sunshine it will ultimately bear fruit so i have heard reports and uh, i'm continuing to hear more reports tomorrow i'll be getting together with a bunch of pastors and i'm looking forward to hearing some some uh, some of the the ripple effect, so to speak, or the after effect. I want to say aftershock, but <laughs> it's the after glory. Hey, somebody's calling me. Yes. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I actually do. I just wasn't sure we were talking about it. Oh, Louie got to watch him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All the way in Mexico. And how many of you know Louie? Okay, we got a couple hands. Not everybody knows him, but uh, he's in Mexico. And through that whole event, was able to uh, reconnect or connect in, in, a, in a way. So good. Anybody else? Yes. Absolutely. No, I think, I think when, you know, there's part of it, we, we always think about the person who's recommitting their lives or the person who's never, you know, that first time commitment. But I think the effect of what I really enjoyed about this whole process was they, they started by focusing on the church and, and the people in the church. And if that can get growing or maturing or expose opportunities, then yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I really, I mean that. If there's something that's happened as a result of just the, the lessons or that night or whatever it was, I think it's, it's good for us to be encouraged. Um, because you know what? If, if you expected there to be no seating room at Cornerstone because we participated in this event, you're going to be sadly discouraged. But if we realize that we were part of somebody's life in Mexico, we were part of somebody's life wherever it may be, and, and I'm anticipating more stories to continue to come because this is alive <laughs> and when it when it gets that chance to be planted we're gonna we're gonna see some some neat things happen and so yes amen if it motivates you good if it helps somebody else good anybody else all right good good 
And that's where some of that, some of that reaffirming can, can be beneficial. We, we, like sheep, have gone astray. And sometimes we need that to bring us back. Yes? Yeah. 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 Good. Good. Yeah. So for those of you who are watching, we're just kind of recapping the look up and some of the effects that have taken place. I apologize. I should have had a microphone. Should have had you all come up so everybody on home could see. Um, come join us. How was that? <laughs> all right. So let's go into this. Look up 2023 is done. It'll never happen again. That doesn't mean a like event or something like that will happen, but this one is done. And what we did prior to this event was preparing for harvest. We walked through these things of what it, what it would be or what it looks like, how, how we should go, and what God has to say. The next logical question is, now that it's done, now what? And so what I'd like to do is consider four different aspects that Jesus presents when he talks about evangelism, missions, his view of the lost, his attempt to get the disciples as well as anybody else that was following him to embrace what it meant to be a part of the harvest. And what do you do after harvest? I, uh, I know that we, we have quoted that verse, and uh, the fields are white under harvest, right? Pray the Lord of the harvest, he will send labors. When you think of the field white under harvest, what kind of crop comes to your mind, Mike? Wheat or barley, okay? Now, how many of you know, yeah, grain, okay, so some, some kind of grain, absolutely. So, so when you think about the harvest of a grain field, where, where is it like wheat? Where is wheat ultimately meant to end up? In bread. bread. What has to happen for that kernel of wheat to become flour, to become bread? You ever thought about the process? <laughs> Got to be cleaned. <laughs> Got to be put in the bucket. What happens to that piece of grain? Got to get crushed. <laughs> okay. And then what, 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 that flour, so my wife makes some really good rolls, but when she makes those rolls, I don't bite into it and get a kernel of wheat. I bite into it and get honey and bread and butter. <laughs> so what has to happen? That wheat has to lose its original identity in order to become that flour and then it's got to mix with eggs. What else do you put in there? Bacon, soda, what? Yeast. It's got to mix with those things. It's got to get along. Imagine the wheat saying, I don't like eggs. No, it mixes. And then when it all gets put together, where, where does it go? Before it goes on the table. Gets in the oven. I mean, talk about talk about being put through something that's not comfortable. Now, what temperature do you make your oven for bread? Three hundred and fifty degrees. I just want you to consider that because as we go through this, that's one one illustration I'm not going to use. But what I am going to use is being born again, like a newborn baby. Now what? Yeah. Oh. I'll let you guys work on that whole thing. I, I think there's a, there's a whole lot of good spiritual stuff there, okay? <laughs> but, but this reality that when Jesus uses these illustrations, there's something there that we can glean from that. You're not going to like everything we present here, but it fits the whole idea that there's a process. So the harvest is great. We prepare for the harvest. We, we plan, we train, we do all this kind of stuff. We have the harvest, and it's great. We get the grain off. We put it in the bin. We pull the potatoes out and put them in the um, potato cellar. 
spend nine months developing a baby, and now what? You got to raise it, just like that bread. You got to raise. You got to let it get raised, right? Oh man, we're getting all kinds of stuff going on here. In our time, in these next four weeks, we're going to look at four things. Number one, being born again. Number two, not necessarily in this order, but from death unto life. What does it mean to be resurrected with Christ? We're going to look at when Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. What's that mean? What's the end result of a good fishing trip? Yeah. And do you, do, you just, do you just take them straight from your fishing net and put them on the wall? Do you just take them straight from the fishing net and slap them like Smeagol on your plate? That's gross, right? No, there's a process involved in order to get it to its destined destiny. And then there's sheep. Cute little lambs. Yeah, we'll get there. So walk with me in these next four weeks during this time where we're going we're gonna to ask the question, now what? Now that the harvest is done, now what is involved? And then, then the better question that, that we'll probably get to eventually is, what's your part in that? Because you're not the fish, the lost are. You're not the little lamb, the lost are. You're not that baby who only knows. Wah! So consider with me a couple of verses. I want you, these are a couple of verses we're going to constantly put, and there will be more and more blanks as we go along. So I'm just trying to get you here we go. All right. Anybody guess the first, first uh, book of the first verse? Corinthians. Okay, Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Oh, I forgot that one. Sorry. In order to go from an ain't to a saint, we need a savior. Okay. I apologize. 2 Corinthians is right, 517. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Good. By the time we're done in four weeks, you will be able to memorize that if you don't have it already, and it will be a good day. All right. The next verse I did, I, I don't know if anybody want to take a guess. What book that's from? Colossians. Good. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory. Whoops, that's my fault. (laughs) Of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, we're going to walk through some things that are going to challenge us with this idea of what does it mean to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Back up one more slide. But I want you to realize that in this, the whole point of Christ in us as the hope of glory is that the Gentiles might know. I want you to note that because the whole point of being saved for some people is, I'm going to go to heaven. The whole point of being saved is, I get my sins rolled away. The whole point of being saved is, I get a chance to start over. Well, all those things may be true, but I want you to realize this, that the riches of the glory of this mystery is meant to be observed. In other words, something has to happen in our lives so that when we go to work for a full year, after having been affected by the, by the, the grace and the mercy of Jesus, people say, something's different about you. You're not like you used to be. And in this idea of going from an ain't to a saint, you can't skip over the Savior. Next slide. As we walk through this, we will be looking at coming alive from the dead, John chapter 11. That's our lesson tonight. We'll be looking at the idea of being born again in John chapter 3. In Matthew 4, Jesus uses this analogy of a fisher or the lost being fish. 
and being fishers of men. And then we'll wrap it up the last week of this month with the idea of lambs. What does it mean to be a lamb? Now, most of you have been here long enough to know that I have this little thing called do your lamb voice. Bah, okay. So I'll give you four weeks to practice that bah, because when we get to that part, we want to be ready to give our bah to the Lord. As we walk through this four weeks, I want to challenge you with a term that sometimes finds us feeling unworthy or feeling that doesn't fit. Next slide. It's the word saint. And a guy by the name of Addison Brevere wrote a book. And uh, if, you, if you'd like to, it's, it's, it, my wife has read it. Uh, I've read parts of it. But let me just read the, the first beginning here. The Bible uses the word Christian to describe followers of Jesus, a grand total. Anybody want to guess? Three times. But there's another identifier that fills the pages of the New Testament, a word we've mistakenly reserved for the hollow wearing elite, losing something profound in the process. Saints. Wrapped in this ancient word is a divine invitation to discover who God created you to be and to awaken to the life you were meant to know. Using scripture and stories, this guy takes his experience and goes from the idea of being called a Christian to embracing the idea that maybe there's something even greater, a higher calling. And if we're not careful, we will relegate ourselves to opting out when in truth, the power of the finished work of the cross is meant to take us into this. So consider with me a couple things. The word saint uh, is a person sanctified and, and that word sanctified, if you've, got, if you've got room on your paper, that word sanctified simply means set apart. So when we think about a saint, we often think, well, they probably live in a, a monastery or they, they fast for 40 days or they don't you know, have any, anything besides a robe they wear. Um, we, put, we put people into that category. But, but consider it's, it's the person who is set apart, a holy or godly person, and can, I, can I ask you, shouldn't that define us? Well, but you're a pastor. No, that's not what it says. It says holy or godly person, one eminent for piety, and that word piety, we're going to define it in just a little bit, um, and virtue. Aren't we supposed to have virtue? It is particularly applied to the apostles and other holy persons mentioned in Scripture. We, we know that. It's usually there. This is Webster's Dictionary. Psalms 16 and verse 3 says, As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. This is God speaking. He delights in those individuals who bear the name saint. In the next one, number two, it says, one of the blessed in heaven, Revelations eleven eighteen 18 says, that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. How many of you feel like you're small? Guess what? You're in there. <laughs> How many of you feel like you're great? Come on. There we go. Okay. I'm great, man. I like myself, right? Guess what? You're in there. <laughs> You, you don't opt out of this, small or great, those who fear your name. At number three, the holy angels are called saints. In Deuteronomy 33 and 3, yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Jude chapter 1 verse 14. This is where Mary and Webster and I have a little bit of disagreement. Because they want to qualify the angels as saints. I'm thinking, according to Revelation, when he comes with 10,000s of his saints, I'm one of them. Because I know how to ride a horse. <laughs> and I'm coming with that, that, that 
herd of horses that are coming behind the one with the white horse. I'm not totally disagreeing with Merriam-Webster, but I do believe that sometimes we put that saint title on, on people that we feel like, oh, I'll never be able to do that. Or angels, I'll never be an angel. When I'm here to tell you that what Jesus did on the cross is powerful enough to take a sinner to a saint. And that is an open call to all to walk in that. Now, number four here real quick, and I, I got to mention this. The, the Catholic Church has done a lot in this area of saints to separate the, the average individual from the super achiever. Whenever we think of saints, we usually think of something extraordinary that was done. A matter of fact, we have in our own home now, yes, I said that, in our own home. The only way he got in was because he had saint on the first part of his. <laughs> and when he doesn't act like a saint, I'd be sure to remind him, okay? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, the, the story behind that, I told, I told Kristen when we got, I said, we got to know the story. We can't have a St. Bernard here and not know the story, okay? But it was, this, it was this guy who used dogs, this particular breed, to rescue people in the snow. I thought, I like that story. Why? Because Jesus is my rescuer, right? So this whole idea, though, of, of sainting individuals or, you know, is to bring to the forefront some grand effort. It's a miraculous thing. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we opt out of this idea, oh, I could never be a saint. When in fact, the cross is powerful enough to transform us from sinner to saint as long as there's a Savior. Yes? And it's gone overboard. I mean, there, there's some people who have just taken that. And again, what I, what I want to challenge you, though, with is don't let that idea of what other people have done, the Catholic Church, uh, the Mormon Church uses that saints a lot. Don't let those things deter you from embracing the fact that when Jesus gave his life, when he said it is finished, he didn't say, well, I'm just going to wash your sins away. He didn't say, I'm just going to take care of you so you can go to heaven. He didn't say, I'm just going to make your life a little easier. He meant for there to be a transformation so powerful that it takes you out of the sinner category and allows you to even consider the possibility that greater things than he did, you can do. That what he's done, you can walk in those steps. You can enjoy that kind of level. So, so when we think about this idea of now that the harvest is done, now what? I want to challenge us. The goal is not just to get them to come to church. The goal is not just to get them to, to you know, not say bad words. Or, 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 you know, don't use the name of the Lord in vain. Or if you steal, don't steal anymore. Or if you, you know, these things. That's part of it. Don't get me wrong. But the high calling that is in Christ Jesus is that we come into this area and mindset of being saints of the Most High. That last, to act with a show of piety. The, the word piety actually is the quality of being religious or reverent. Now, I'm going I'm to camp out here just a moment because the word religion has really gotten a, a battering over the years to where I have heard people tell me, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Really? And I hear it at the juvenile <laughs> level. I hear it at the um, uh, county level. I've heard it at the state level. They're individuals who are trying to distinguish themselves from the churchgoer, but still validate themselves as a person who believes in Jesus. Well, James tells us even the devil believes there's one God. He ain't going to heaven, though. 
And so I think there's a point at which we got to look at this word religion and, and help us understand. So I did a study at one time. Religious, if you look at the word religious, just in the without church connections, you see there a person who is constantly repeating a pattern or is constantly promoting a pattern of living. In other words, you can be a religious football fan. And I think we all know some, <laughs> okay? Every Sunday, they are going, they're not going to miss their game. It's not just football, it's baseball, it's tennis, it's golf. It's, they are not going to. And in that sense of their commitment, they are religious. Matter of fact, I don't think it would be a far stretch to say that they have made that entertainment a religion. So the idea of being religious here in the word piety is to act in a way of religion. Now, we know that religion without relationship is going to be a dead end street. Got it. But that doesn't mean there is not a pure religion and undefiled before God. Anybody know where that, what book that's in? James chapter 1. There is a pure religion. In other words, yes, I get it. There's a false religion out there. But don't sacrifice that practice of godliness religiously because you don't want to be identified as a religious person. Because if you look at the idea of a saint, a saint is somebody whose lifestyle constantly promotes several things. A reverence. A charity. Here's some synonyms that go with it. Devoutness. Devotion piousness, religiousness, religion, holiness, godliness, sanctity, sanctitude, saintliness, devotion to God, veneration, reverence, faith, religious duty, spirituality, sacredness, religious zeal, fervor, pietism, and religiosity. Now, I'll take about seven of those words and totally get rid of them because of what the world has done to those things that we call good. But there's some words in here like godliness. That should define us. There's some words like sanctified. That should define us. How come you don't talk like other people? Because I'm sanctified. How come you don't have the same passions like other people in the world or like you used to have? Because I'm devoted to God. I have a reverence. We are to be not only people of faith, but we should live in a household of faith. So I hope by, by taking us to this point, realizing that, yes, the Look Up Tour was, was effective in reaching out to people, bringing people, uh, touching people in Mexico, touching people in different states. The point of salvation, the point of being caught <laughs> like a fish or being birthed like a baby is to become a saint. Well, I ain't no saint yet. Then maybe you need a savior. Did everybody get that? Here's my, here's my conundrum. When you opt out of the characteristics of godliness... You sacrifice the potential of the cross to transform you from glory to glory, to take you from where you used to be and make you a new creation, right? A saint. Well, I ain't no saint. Tell Jesus that as he's on the cross. That's what he died for. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Note this. A hypocrite may imitate a saint. Th this is where I think religion has got its, got its conundrum. Because you can act religious. First Timothy tells us you can have a form of godliness, but not have the power. So a hypocrite can... Fold their hands just right. Count the number of Hail Marys they're supposed to say. Sing the songs. 
I mean, I know some people who they can sing the songs, but they don't bear fruit. And so what we've got to do is realize that when we are part of a harvest, there is a process that's meant to take place because the ultimate goal is the high calling that's in Christ Jesus, not just settling for a one-way ticket to heaven. And I'm convinced that some of the challenge in our Christian witness is others who have settled for just getting their sins forgiven rather than following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Now, next slide. This is my two, two verses that I'm going to bring out, actually three, but two places. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Read it with me if you would. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now look at your neighbor and say, that's transformation. I have been transformed. Amen. <laughs> do, do we really believe that? Or, well, I just go to church on Sunday now. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I do that, but I can still be the same, right? When you use the word transformer, our little kids will see this. I'm sorry. Boom, thank you. <laughs> right? The whole purpose of that little toy is to change. And look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 and 29. I think we all, we've all heard this before. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestines, read this, the bold print, here we go, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's transformation. I can't act like I used to act if I'm supposed to be looking or conformed to Jesus. So when we think about now what, it's the process that needs to be put in place in order to get that person who made a first-time commitment or recommitted their lives into this, this, this I don't want to say assembly line because it's not assembly line, but it's a journey a journey that takes them from what they used to be, how they used to think, how they used to talk, how they used to walk, where they used to go. And I don't do that anymore. Why? Oh, you're religious. No, I've got a relationship. Well, you're just holier than thou. Well, I'm holier than I was. Uh, you're just too good. No, he's good. And he lives in me. So if there's any good, it's him. But I can't go back there. Why? Because I'm, I'm on a journey to become one of the saints. I'm on a journey that demonstrates the redemptive power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And to go backwards is going to say something different. When we realize that this whole point of the harvest is to bring people to a point where they begin the journey to be conformed to the image of Jesus, to embrace the idea that I am a chosen vessel, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, some of you were here for the Exodus journey, right? You remember? That's what God told the children of Israel. And when they came out of Egypt, the whole plan was to transform them from a generation of generational slaves into a kingdom of priests. That's going to take some transformation. Next click. When I think of transformation, I often think of a butterfly. This little caterpillar that crawls up. I like how they crawl. That little inchworm <laughs> goes like that. Yeah. And when you see that little caterpillar, I don't see wings. 
I don't see uh, the butterfly with these long antennas. I just see this little worm-looking thing. Doesn't look anything like a butterfly, right? But you let that little butterfly begin to get wrapped up in a cocoon and left alone, I, I heard the story one time of a kid who, who found a cocoon and he, he took the cocoon and he, he put it, broke it off, the, or not, he broke the branch off, put it in a jar and he watched it and he watched it. And pretty soon he started to see something moving on the cocoon and, and this, this butterfly was trying to get out and squeezing and turning and, and um, obviously he wasn't crying for help, but, but it, it, was, it was that... Uh, uh, uh. And, and I, you can just imagine this little kid trying to, trying to watch this. And pretty soon he just couldn't help himself. He's like, this little guy needs help. So he reached in there and he broke a little bit of the cocoon off and opened it up. Oh, there you go. Some of you have heard this story. That butterfly never flew. The process of wiggling and squirming and breaking and coming out of that is what God designed in order to develop the muscles so those big old wings could catch air. But because that butterfly missed the opportunity, because somebody just wanted to help, it never got the opportunity to fly. Yeah, there's all kinds of spiritual things going on in my head right now, all kinds of things. Let, let me just say this. I don't believe it's a coincidence that this little illustration comes in. And when you're going through a struggle, don't give up. Because what may be happening and very often does is in that confined, in that restricted, in that challenge of struggle, there's muscles being developed is it any wonder that Isaiah says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength? It can be a struggle in the waiting. But what God ultimately wants to do is raise us up above our circumstances. So as we consider 1 Peter 2.9, and it challenges us with what I used to be, Right? And what I can be. When we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, it again challenges me with what I used to be and what I can be. And when we see that newborn baby child, do we see something that is going to stay three days old forever? Matter of fact, I've heard, I've heard people say, especially grandparents, don't blink. Because by the time you blink, they're going to be 15. You're going to look back at their life. Where did all the time go? I've, I've watched these little lambs. We've, I've helped them be born. And man, it just seems like they grow over the summer. These, these new lives begin to take on and they take off. And we find ourselves challenged with the process. So, as we consider these two verses, there's, a, there's a, a challenge before us. And that is, am I going to stay sinner or am I going to pursue saint? Because if I do nothing... Jesus told, told a parable one time. He said there was a person who was delivered from demons. And the demon went out. Actual deliverance. It was, it was meant to be separated. And found a dry and weary place. So the demon said, I'm going to go back. and Check out where I used to live. And when he got back, he found that it was clean and orderly and everything was right. But it was empty. And so Jesus says, the demon went out and got seven more. And the end of that 
person's life was worse than the beginning. My, my point is this. You don't just come to Jesus and be forgiven of your sins and then do nothing. And I say that to the person who gave their life to Jesus, but I also say it to us because that's a brand new baby. What does a baby do when it's got an empty tummy? Cries. He doesn't say, hey, can I go to McDonald's and order me a cheeseburger? No, that baby just cries. It just sits there, hoping somebody will come along. I challenge you to be that somebody in somebody's life who needs their bottle. Somebody who needs that encouragement. Somebody who needs that challenge. Saint, oh, I don't know if I could ever do that. How about let Jesus be the one that determines? Sinner, oh, I know you can do that. That's what you used to be. And when that new person comes to you and they're wrestling with the high calling that's in Christ Jesus or just going back to what it was I used to do, we need to be there as believers saying, come on, it's worth it. It's worth denying yourself and taking up your cross. It's going to be worth it. That high calling and being in that realm of sainthood. And, and again, I don't mean that by the Catholic version of it. I'm talking about the biblical version, which means we have become like Christ. That's the ultimate goal. That's the ultimate goal. All right. Everybody got that? So, what's the ultimate goal of the harvest of 2023? 20, Saints. Oh, no, no. We were, just, we were just there to have, to make decisions. Okay. If that's all you want, guess what? You got it. Uh, we, were, we were just there to, you know, listen to Crowder. Okay. You got it. We just wanted to see if we could fill up the Mountain America Center. Okay, you got it. I have a feeling when I go to that pastor's lunch tomorrow, they're not going to be, I mean, they're, they're excited that there was a filled auditorium. They're excited for the decisions that were made. But the challenge is now going to be keep them going. Grow up. Don't waste the grace. <laughs> You get my point? And I'm, I know I'm talking to people who have been in church for a lot of your lives, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to triple dog dare you. Don't let this idea of I can just settle and cruise my way to heaven become part of your journey because it's a high calling that we've been called to, and I want to put it out there. We are to be the saints of the Most High. What does that require? Turn with me to John chapter 11. If you don't have your Bibles there, I've, I've got it on the board here. Follow along with me. We're not going to go into every little detail. I'm going to intentionally avoid the rabbit trails or the distractions and hopefully bring us all the way through this story to the very last because the very last end is what we need to be viewing when it comes to this idea of people being dead in their sins and coming to a new life in Christ. The story goes like this. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the, that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters went to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Mary and her sister, or Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he, <laughs> he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. Turn to your neighbor and ask him this question. Is that a setup or a setback? How many, of you, how many of you believe that Jesus 
pausing two more days was actually a set up, not a setback. <laughs> but how many of you have been guilty of the fact that when you prayed and God waited to answer, you felt like it was a setback in your faith? Okay, good enough. All right, here we go. Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. What is Jesus' view of death? Rest. Sleep. How many of you know somebody who feels like, man, if you die, it's all over? I love what Billy Graham said. One of these days you're going to hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe it. At that point, I will be more alive than I've ever been. <laughs> okay. I, I came across that quote uh, before my, my dad passed away, and, and that was part of my response. Uh, that is just, yes, right? So when Jesus views death, he doesn't see it as a dead end. He sees it as rest. I mean, maybe that's where the rest in peace, the rip came from, right? So as you go around, you've noticed some decorations, people doing all this kind of stuff for, for All Saints Day Eve. And the reality of what they're putting on has its essence in how Jesus viewed this rest in peace. He says, Lazarus is sleeping. Now, we're going to find out later, but I want you to hold on to that. Because when you think about a person being dead in their sins... Does Jesus see that as a dead-end street? They just need to be awakened. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. They've been lulled into a delusion, into a sleep. They are dead in their sins. That doesn't mean it's over for them. They just need a witness to come along like you, filled with his spirit, to awaken. Verse 12. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking a rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Isn't that great? I'm glad we weren't there because y'all need to learn something. <laughs> okay. That is not an excuse for being late, by the way. I, chapter and verse, Jesus can get away with that. It doesn't work for me. I am, can you imagine me coming home late? I am so glad I'm late because now I'm going to teach you a lesson. That would not fly, okay? <laughs> not good marriage counseling if anybody's okay out there. All right. Thomas, verse 16. Uh, then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the disciples had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, is it okay if I change my voice? Because it just this is what I hear in my head. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it. I don't think she sounded just like that, but I want you to understand that there was something going on in her, and there was a conundrum going on in her. It was, number one, I know what happens when people die, and for four days they're dead, but I also know who you are. I want you to get that because that's the tension, that's the stress in some of our situations. We know what's going on in our situation. The doctor said this is happening. The lawyer said this is happening. The weatherman says this is happening. But we have a God who's the master of the wind, who is the one who is victor over death, hell, and the grave. We hold on to that with one hand, and we're not denying what's happening, but we've got a challenging going on. So thank you for enduring my voice because I feel that tension in my own reading. 
She's got a battle going on. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, this is a great part, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Do you know what she didn't say in that part, in that verse? I know it'll be okay later, but I don't have help now. I don't have my brother now. I, I want my brother now. <laughs> you, you get that point? He, she's saying, I, I know that, but what about now? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and li believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? If he was asking you, would you answer? Yes? So here's a little tongue twister for you. If you die before you die, then when you die, you'll never die. You got that? Say it with me. If you die before you die then when you die, you never die. Yeah, go tell, go tell the cashier tomorrow at the, at the store or tell your cousin anyway. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, you got it. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling to you, for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came there where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, I'll skip the voice thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you lain him? Why do you think Jesus groaned? Huh? Disbelief? People's, people's lack of faith, okay. Any, anybody else? Well, why do you think Jesus would have groaned? Yeah. <laughs> I think there's something to be said about the fact that Jesus knows where Lazarus is. He's down there with David talking about how David killed a giant with his own sword. Or is he up there talking with Elijah and Moses? I, I don't know, but it, it makes sense that, that Jesus is like, you know what? He, he's just sleeping. He's taking a nap. It's all right. He, he's, he's, it's, it's better where... <laughs> and yet, I will be honest with you, how many times have we responded in the same way we're not content to wait for what's coming. We want it now. And that's what Mary, Martha had already said. If you'd have been here, Mary comes along and says, the same thing. <laughs> if you'd have been here, you wouldn't have had to come when he's dead. I'm, I'm way off here. I'll, I'll get back on track. He groans in the spirit and was troubled. They said to him, Lord, come and see. And in verse 35, Jesus wept. One of the shortest verses in the Bible. And it, in, it, it finds itself between two places where he groans. Indicating the idea that there's a troubling going on. It, is the unbelief, I think that's, that's part of that. The inability to embrace something greater than this life is also part of that. <laughs> My, somebody, somebody said, and I, I, I'm trying to be real kind when, when people do this, like, well, your dad's up there waiting for you. I said, no, he's not. Are you kidding me? He's sitting there with Jesus, and they're talking about some stuff that I have no, or he's in awe of the grand. He's not waiting on me. I know my dad better than that. 
He wouldn't even wait on my mom in the airport. He'd say, I'll go ahead and make sure everything's good. And then she'd catch up. Jesus wept. And I really do believe that there's an element of truth in the fact that he knew that in order to, in, 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 excuse me, in, in bringing Lazarus back to life, it simply would set the stage for another death. Lazarus died twice. And when that person who comes to Jesus and surrenders their life, takes up their cross, and then we want to revive them back into what they've come from, it's got to be another death. I heard the story of a popular um, uh, pastor down south who had a very well-known um, performer give his life to the Lord. And after a course of things, he came to the pastor and he says, you know, I'm, I'm a musician, I'm, a, I'm an artist, uh, what should I do? And the pastor said, go back to what you were doing. And I will hear, I'm here to tell you, if I told you the name of the performer, you'd, you'd agree. He's not in a better place now. If anything, he's delusioned into the idea that I can still do what I used to do, and it's okay because this pastor said so. As we consider this process whereby somebody comes from death unto life, we need to realize that when they come into that life of Christ-likeness, it's meant to be a never-die-again situation, not go back out. Hebrews tells us we can't crucify Jesus afresh. Verse 36, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind who had kept, excuse me, also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister <laughs> of him who was dead, said to him, come on, read this with me. Lord, by this time there is a, in our less sophisticated language, she basically said, Jesus, he stinks. <laughs> for he has been dead for four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, I got to do this. Lazarus! Get on out here! <laughs> That's not what he said. Come forth! That, that I, he didn't just, hey, Lazarus, come on. I think he, he let it out. After all, he was dead, right? Four days dead. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So when a person comes to Jesus and they come from darkness into light, when they come from the grave of sin into a new life in Christ, what do we do? Jesus lays it out here that our responsibility, his responsibility, excuse me, is to raise the dead. I can't do that, but Jesus can. I don't know the hearts of those who came to Christ for the first time and made a profession of faith, but Jesus knows. And here's what else I know. Jesus said, it's the spirit that convicts them of sin. So Will Graham can't even take credit for it. Crowder can't take credit for it. None of us can take credit for it. If they made a first-time commitment, it's the result of the Spirit of God moving and convicting in their hearts. That's the responsibility of Jesus. 
But what's my responsibility? Say again? Help them, help them change what? In this particular story, help them change what? It's on the last line. Grave clothes. Somebody said it. Help him get out of his grave clothes. But he stinks. That's what death will do to you. He's got a face cloth. Somebody's got to get that off so he can see that he's alive. <laughs> Here's another illustration. I'm almost done. Lazarus. Wrapped up. He hears, Lazarus, come forth. How am I supposed to get up? <laughs> okay, that was maybe a little bit overboard, but I hope you get my point. He's bound. <laughs> How he made it from that bench to the door, I don't know. It may have looked something like this. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's bouncing his way out. And the crazy thing is, is Jesus has to tell people to go loose him. It's like, I think he needs help. Yeah, you're going to do it? No, I'm not going to do it. This guy's been dead for four days. I don't know how he got off that bench. From what I understand, there's a place where they lay the, the mummified. They, they take him off. He bounces. I think he bounces out. Gets out there, and he's probably like, Whew, this is hard work. And then Jesus says, hey, y'all, help him. So when somebody comes from death unto life, when somebody finds themselves in that light, when they've lived in darkness, our part is to help them change their clothes. Whatever's death, get rid of it. You won't need those clothes anymore. You won't need that tomb again. Let's go live instead of going backwards. So the harvest is done. Those who have made commitments have made commitments. And when we run into them, let's be ready to help them get out of the grave clothes. Amen. Now, you got a back part of your sheet, and I really am wrapping this up. But on the back part of your sheet, I want you to take some time. You don't have to do it right now. You can take it home with you. What are grave clothes for you? What would be grave clothes in our day? Because when you see those things come, you need to help that person who has just put their faith in Jesus Christ to understand you don't need that anymore. Let's pray. Our gracious God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time tonight. Help us, Jesus. Help us to set our sights on becoming those saints, joining the ranks of those saints who are living in the finished work of Calvary, filled with your power, anointed and ready to help. Jesus, I'm praying for those who are here tonight to be able to have an encounter with somebody who may still be wrapped up in some grave clothes and help us to lead that person to a life of freedom, free from the grave clothes of the grave and living a life filled with you. Lead us, I pray. Guide us, direct us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless.